Hello everyone, my name is Nicholas Lachlan and I'm the Program Director of the NGC Bookers Lit Fest, here to welcome you to this first ever completely online and virtual version of our Sunday launch event, which is a fixture of our usual festival program. Launching new books is one of our favourite things to do at the festival, and today, Sunday the 3rd of May, should have been the final day of the 2020 NGC Bookers Lit Fest, I should be talking to you from the National Library building in downtown Port of Spain. But of course, many of our plans have been upended by the COVID pandemic. And like lots of other cultural events around the world, we've had to postpone our festival, in our case until September. However, even in very strange and anxious times like these, literature is never postponed. Literature never pauses. So readers are continuing to read, and writers are continuing to write, and new books are continuing to be published, uh, including the three books we're going to celebrate this afternoon by Funcho Ayejina, Kinesia Lubrin, and Jacob Ross. First up this afternoon is Funcho Ayejina, who was born in Nigeria, but has spent most of his life and career here in Trinidad and Tobago, where he was a lecturer at the University of the West Indies. He taught me there many years ago, and where he's now an emeritus professor. He's also very well known as a mentor to younger writers uh, through the university's Creative Writing MFA program, also through the Cropper Foundation's Biennial Writers Workshop, and of course through the NGC Bookers Lit Fest, where Funcho is the deputy festival director. Funcho is so well known as a supporter of other writers that I think it's easy to forget he's an extraordinary writer himself. He's a writer of fiction, his best known work of fiction is probably The Legend of the Rock Hills, which won the Commonwealth Writers Prize for the Africa region 20 years ago. He's a writer of biography, and he's also a poet. He's published two previous books of poems, and his most recent book, The Errors of the Rendering, is his third book of poems. The Errors of the Rendering draws on traditional Yoruba knowledge, uh, Yoruba culture, and it's full of very sharp observations that are equally apt to the Caribbean where Funcho is physically situated these days. Uh, Funcho's imagination bridges the Atlantic and the poems do the same thing. And like Funcho himself, the poems are equally at home in Nigeria, in Trinidad and Tobago, and in anywhere that is the Caribbean. Here's Funcho Ayejina. Welcome one and all. Thank you for attending this virtual launch of my third book of poems, The Errors of the Rendering. I would like to start with gratitude. Gratitude to my publishers, PayPal Tree, and gratitude to NGC Bookers Lit Fest for making it possible for this book to be introduced to the public in spite of the lockdown. The title of the collection is taken from Christopher Okibo, the Nigerian poet who has had the most influence on me as a poet. In a way, therefore, this collection celebrates those writers and individuals who have contributed significantly to my development as a writer. I am particularly grateful to the native intellectuals of my cultures, the poets under whose wings I grew up. I thank them for their wisdom. I thank them for their love of language. The collection is also dedicated to my two sons. And um, I would like to start by reading two poems for them. The first one is an invocation under traveling feet. Oh, Johnny, bless their feet with the understanding that passeth all understandings of the endless opening and multiple closure points on circles. Guide their feet onto paths that terminate on the edges of dark forests with fully formed magic flutes poised to lure pilgrims into fecund secrets. Ferment their visions into actions that are primed, set, and ready to release the redolent futures in the seeds under their traveling feet. 
Lead them unto freedom roads that go to rest by full rivers on which their wanderlust may set sail for unexplored seas of stories. With friends like them. When your friends demand in the name of science to let them break their coconuts on your head as a test of the strength of the human cranium, tell them to let you be the scientist and they the subjects of the inquiry. Affirm in your most refined inflection that whatever happens to their gray matter, you will faithfully record your findings in the most legible cursive handwriting on the pages of your hardback lab book with the gold trimmings and ornate lock to be secured inside a termite proof safe for the benefit of posterity, theirs and yours. Context and balance are two central principles in my culture. And the next uh, poems I'm going to read have to do with context. Context one. Belelako Olabo. Context is that key that opens the door to the chamber of meanings. A wood culture prides itself in the details in its masterpieces, but lives in perpetual fear of self welling fires and voracious termites. A stone culture lacks the intricacies of woodworks, but sleeps soundly from one age to the next. O yigi yigi, or taaiku. Even though the elements may chip away unseen at our rock hills, we cannot dispose of stones the way we dispense with basins of dirty dish water. Iron thumbs its chest to affirm a superiority over wood and over stone. But the poet reminds Iron that it was safe only as long as it avoided sea water. Without context, there are no shades under which meanings can seek refuge. Context 5. What comes after 6 is more than 7 or even 9. The first is a sonic metaphysical threat in the mouths of Yoruba people. The second is a position of pleasure in the bedroom of a French couple. The essence of an abiku is more than the sum total of his multiple deaths, more than the beginnings in his ends and the ends in his beginnings. Abiku manipulates his every death and rebirth. Methuselah can only delay his one and only death. With or without a full hand, with or without a joker in the park, even if you are more of an Anansi than Harry Handcuff Houdini, or a fully grown camel threading through the blind eye of a needle, no matter your gift, no matter your luck, you cannot escape from life alive. Even their divine miracle worker had to die in order to conquer death and to prove that what comes after death is more than the death of death. making meanings. It is noble to help the weak with their crosses, 
to allow them time to recoup their ebbing strength. But no matter how enduring the staying power of a helper, he may not carry a cross beyond Golgotha. When a journey grows longer than the road, the traveler brings the journey to an end before his end. Is that why the believers accuse us of carrying our offerings past the mosque of Prophet Muhammad, peace be unto him? Our offerings are destined for an altar named Balance, the abode of issue, not for their mosques or their tabernacles. There are many pathways into our markets. None may claim to be the only path to profit. Not even the same road in, same road out on which we depart from home is the same as the same road in, same road out on which we return to home. When our journey grows longer than our road, we extend the road. The Orisha tradition is perhaps the most visible manifestation of the connection between the New World and Africa. The next poem is an Oshun poem, Oshun being a very major deity both in Nigeria and in the New World, especially Trinidad and Tobago. The Sixteen-Eyed Lamp Side the wicks deep in the sockets of Yeye Oshun's signature lamp. Saturate the sixteen eyes of our water goddess of the white realm with virgin oil from the unblemished first fruits of palm trees that have never been ear or eye marked for wine. Ignite the lamp and the cheerful mass of devotees in white with the message from Unrumila's 16 divination notes. Banish the dark, dark curses conjured by degenerate priests with Mother Oshun's fire that burns bright without emitting heat. We ate the Isoye leaf of understanding so we may grow wiser in the house of Ifa. We drank Suru, the water of patience, so we may inherit balance from the house of Eshu, Elegbara. We applied honey to our tongues, the better to craft our request for blessings in sweet songs to Yeye Oshu, the sometimes consort of Onumila. We know, no matter how bright a lamp may burn, it cannot see its own base. No matter how clean a mirror is, it cannot mirror itself to itself. No matter how sharp a knife is, it cannot cut patterns on its own hilt. Even with a self-regenerating gift and a magnifier for good measure, an eye can only behold itself reflected. The past is fixed. We can only rearrange its antique furniture to suit our modern tastes. We know a village without a river is a village without a mirror. Because the penumbra is the domain of Arumila, the sage in the spotless free-flowing white garb, the divine hacker into the future in the past and the past continuous in a yet-to-be-lived life. We seek liminal truths in twilight zones and spring forward like arrows in flight towards the green light in the distance, beckoning us towards the immortal lighthouse constructed by the mortally wounded weaver bird before his terminal retreat into the redolent white chamber of the queen of the damp half-light with castaway straws and leftover mortar from mansions calibrated to keep out our age-sculptured mothers of the earth 
our truth spouting pan wine drinkers, and the long white beard of our dead diviners. We know a village without a poet is a village without a river. We know a town without a river is a town without a goddess. We know Oshobo is the home of Yeyeoshun. She swaps her white wrap for a pink frock to vacation at the estuary at Salibia as the lady of sweet water with her flock. Set the wicks deep in the 16 eyes of Yeye Oshun's ritual lamp in Oshobo. Light 16 pink candles to the goddess of love at Salibia on the way to Toko. And finally, when a road crosses a river, when a road crosses a river, we ask, which is older, the river or the road? When a road crosses a road, we ask, what is the end game in their secret vows? A consummation into a four-headed junction? Or a submission of one will to the next with the weaker right angulating its ambition to the conquering ways and means of the other? When a road crosses a river or another road and they pause ever so briefly to exchange temperaments and to share an embrace before heading their separate ways, we consecrate their curse out point, their point of self-negation and mutual recognition into an orita shrine to a Shulaoye, guardian of intersections. A safe harbor for mongrel souls in search of homes. Buoyed by the knowledge that destinations are ordained by unique obsessions. And the sometimes mandatory, sometimes voluntary alterations we make to them. I thank you all for your attention and I hope as soon as this new normal improves that as many of you will go out there and buy copies of the book. There are many more from where this came. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our second writer this afternoon is Canicia Lubrin, who was born in St. Lucia and currently lives in Canada. Canicia is Yet another reminder that the island of St. Lucia has contributed way more than its fair share of extraordinary poets to world literature. Canicia was a guest at our festival last year in 2019, where we heard her read from her debut book, Voodoo Hypothesis, which was widely acclaimed across Canada and in the Caribbean. A few weeks ago, she published her second book of poems, The Dysgraphist, which is even more thrilling. It is a book length poem in seven acts that ranges over issues of personal identity, community, migration and history, climate change, all in a voice that is searching and compelling and confident, and which doesn't sound like anyone else's. This is Canicia Lubrin. Hi, everybody. My name is Canicia Lubrin. I am the author of The Dysgraphist, a book of poetry which presents seven inquiries into selfhood through the perennial figure uh, named Jejun. Um, the book mines meaning of kinship across geographies and generations through the wide and intimate reach of language and set against the backdrop of contemporary capitalist fascism, toxic nationalism, um, and climate disaster. And the figure Jejun asks throughout the book, how have I come to make a home out of unrecognizability? And I will read to you from the first act 
of the poem. Part one. <clears throat> Prologue. Dysgraphia. Noun. Psychiatry. Dysgraphia. By the imprint, the link, the image displayed through nothing here. The kinds of given names. The coming away unmarked. The wonder at this edge, if it is eye's edge. At this head, if it is eye's head, full of a disappearing act. Assembled cautiously in eye as those children of today. As the mouth turning out the speed of sound. Now in this 621 a.m. breeze. With someone, maybe you, still alive with familiar irresistible mystery, where I choreographs the maneuver of to come and give way, where the world is full of reasons to push the back seat down and set a life force soaring back to its ragged world, to the ones preoccupied with the ragged that is I, the ragged that implores, the ragged that turns all narcotic and detour, that thing can name what it survives in the inn and gives hell on the way out. Act One Ain't I at the Gate? Is it not enough to enter, ending oneself in the halving road, and the fires in us blot the coasts that reject us? And we sugar the desert we screed, frantic for fullness, if fragile, if symbols, if nothingness, at first a doubt escalating our verbings, if still ourselves a thing to become, past wavering interests in peace, given only for spilling. Recall that face, which is no face, a craved choice, Eureka in someone's drawn God. I and the next could praise now, if I were not set ablaze enough. If that morning I hadn't the thirst to lean into the world, with an ear to a mouth, begging for the happened thing, for something disguised. What could prove this dust is freshly mouthed, not some cyclic, newly vaporized empire settling its faithless wages. Eyes masses, these bent backs, enough. Mweni male, mani le, that never ending suku, say sanu, this is it, our dead land. Raw as the last bomb leaves our storied hand. Kite nula, which mother te manje yish? Look, we, a conversation, be pointing ceaselessly homeward. Whose earth is left without a means to unwant us in place? Why we sing back anyway, the chaotic corners of mind after wretched mind? Who is left after the dysenteries, after the cities and the ruining magic we no longer believe? A dusk we no longer need. What is I? But to have always been there. I've asked it. What is I? I in an own place. I is here, breeding out of the dead land, a definable origin, where everyone is, yet to be named equipment, as if whole, were news of uncut humanities discarded, whole islands made of antagonizing food, lift today, Pacific Ocean, tomorrow, Indian Ocean, and then another tomorrow, another ocean, surge clearing wave where nothing is open, where things exist to be drawn outward by singing, how nakedly the dawn spills or lifts in the responsibility of doves emerging with their late summer songs in early June. I want none of the peril, unless to flag a bush one risking the dark in me, in the voice of I's mother, in bacterial forces unbelief. The stoppages of one, maybe two hundred stages of rupture. As I enters the current blank shots of work, I leaves the Baltic zone in its cubicle and seabed, unchanged. Why de-escalate the science from its pain? 
some westerly continent is paramour. The minute I must resolve to process the rate at which to belong to whatever, the speed at which to spring the codes of stoicism from their pure energy. A ruby caught just barely in that one airlobe I lusts after. I has crossed the hair-like perimeter, giving a fuck, like a press gang to submarine crew, marching moss-grown intentions in a vote, the obligatory panacea against Napoleonic time, meaning bested nausea, meaning desire into threat of illness or expanded lives. I would like to find lodging the world depends on, some craft of soil and seashells, unafraid of robotic futures. What is any of this to the characteristic poor? And the woods pull out their hair as I slant something like a root. I stagnant, uncommitted to the scrutiny of another passerby, adrift in their love-drunk uncertain self, before one woman sucks another woman out of an accounting, into hunger for hashtag prison strikes. I is a quick slash on the tongue, drawing the head up to read cities out of their bricks' hard-won lines, their messaging, the blocked repose of regular Sundays, an excuse you already know. What will hold the lines straight? What forms the mason's name in its original unoriginal Portuguese, or was it once Italian, once Irish, Yiddish even, superscript of all the native tongues gone lent, what I eats, Mamaila, I becomes the Creole mouth, him ya house belong me, kaisala si somewhere, him here house belong me, like eyes at the gate, not like eyes again. Here, plank the tongue that nails year by year a hope to leave unmarked by this life, this life mortally wounded with unspeaking, still able to make crystalline rock, grow eyes trained on the roads that turn three walks into grace, or gale, these wrecks in the Baltic said to belong to no one, in the usual speed of animals aware Giants, too, get lost. Children make a disturbance and call to us. Come, enter now, a birth, a studied life, reordering of things yet formed, not yet speech. I could feel two lungs hassling, a hindrance to what is cleanly wanted, unrewound. What else is need or needed? Telepathy, then? the millions jostling for space among all the dead things kept alive. And it's true, the bush ones at the gate, observing this neuron decade. In it was an orange night full of talk, then again at the gate, the double delirium of a morning armed to drain the ocean of its careful frequencies, limbs turning up all this fanfare, Una grande fonction. All I want is to kiss any forehead, still wet with no false innocence. What I believe will raise mercy against all this hesitation, all this public applause. And I regret to think someone will erase our experiences of this world, just to push I out the crest of it, and to make something beautiful of it, now yellowed with waking. I quailed, but speech, the unhearing that gives I the true world, the mouth out of shape at the sawtoothed cliffs of Mornidor is a becoming. The green center of where to grow after refusal, the big entering the small, that cleaves what I has not yet been driven mad for discovering. I pulls off I's toes and leaves them near the sea. Eyes see, back to the sea as before, yet an hour's drift from Manzanilla, which is no place but a word I loves. I knows what begins the act of saying things, what is lodged there, 
a promise of some life. Not unlike this cold grey sky. Not unlike the not good marching band a street away, throwing madness out with eyes lonely discography. I says, please, without toes. But what about these feet? Now that they are not seized in their act of marking things, disappeared things, things given over to the gesture, the method, to the field a wash and undertow. What is love but the hand returning to claim the dust red, black, white, as a cold swept evening? Here a burnt mountain side, season setting aside their obscene openings. I, who's only ever sensed these three yards, before a stiff trunk shirks off its tattoo of ringed wisdoms, or maybe years, yes, all that they are, in the mouse vein muscle. A family in a struck way budgets the death of their vagrant cousin to the obsolescing tar. Nothing like a sentimental drudge through the what-ifs. Nothing like a morning so unclear as to leave I before the opening I knows where to find. And like the cousin who has been missing for a decade, ever where I should forget I's own vagrancy. Who were you before I, speaking of beginnings? Here, beginning the unbeginning, owning nothing but that wounding sense of waking to speak as I would. After the floods then, after women unlike Eve, giving kind to the so-and-so, trying to tell them it is time to be unnavigable. After calling them back to what the cut tongue speaks, cutting the thing of them rolled into stone. Speaking I, after all. After all theories of abandonment, priced and displayed. The word was a moonlit knife, with those arrivants lifting their hems to dance, toeless, with the footless child they invent. Thank you for joining me. Our third writer this afternoon is Jacob Ross, a Grenadian writer who's lived in the United Kingdom for many years. Uh, his books include the monumental novel Pinter Bender, He's one of the contemporary Caribbean's great short story writers, and his short fiction was collected a couple of years ago in the book, Tell No One About This. More recently, he's been publishing the Camaho Trilogy of Literary Crime Fiction, set in the fictional Caribbean island of Camaho, which is based on Grenada. The first book in the series, The Bone Readers, won the inaugural Jalak Prize in the United Kingdom, and Jacob has just published the second book in the series, Black Rain Falling. This is the book that grabs you literally from the first page, uh, not just with the twists and turns of the plot, but with the voice of its protagonist, Digger Digson. Uh, it's a book that tackles very vital issues of the contemporary Caribbean about violence, about class, about gender, and about power and politics. Here's Jacob Ross. Thank you for inviting me to participate in the Bocas Literary Festival's 10th anniversary event. And congratulations also on your 10th anniversary. It's a magnificent achievement, as far as I can see, and I'm very happy to be part of it. Uh, so thank you for inviting me to share my work with a wider audience in the virtual sense, in the online sense. Yeah, It's a new world. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to read from... My second book, second in the Kamaho Quartet of novels, which I decided to write um, some time ago. And they're crime novels, they're Caribbean crime novels. And this particular novel is about um, this young man who is a detective. His name is Michael Digger Dixon. Uh, he is a forensics expert. And um, in this case here, in this particular book, uh, his fellow CID officer, Miss Stanislaus, kills a man in self-defense, but their superiors believe that it was murder because she had very personal issues with this man who assaulted her when she was a child and left her with a child. Digger is given just six weeks to prove that Miss Stanislaus is innocent. 
on top of that, there is a terrible roadside murder that you know has taken place. And it starts them off, Miss Tanis Laws <clears throat> and this uh, digger and San Andrews CID on a complex web of you know discoveries and intrigues and uh, um, because the island is becoming or has become a stop off point in the cocaine trade between Colombia, Venezuela and North America. And the Grand Mistanis laws have to stop it. They have to stop it because this is the first foray into that island territory. And they know that they have to break it from the beginning before it really takes root. So th this is the, so these are the two kind of driving elements in, in the novel. I chose the name Kamaho because Kama, Kamahoin was the original name of Grenada, the island on which I was born. And that, that was the Amerindian name. And of course, when the Europeans came, they changed it. I'll begin the first chapter. The voice, the narrative voice is Digger. One thing I learned from my two years fighting crime in Kamaho, sometimes to uphold the law, you need to break the fucking rules. Five days after I arrested a police officer, for drink driving and much worse, the Stanis Laws, my partners in San Andrew CID, shot down Juba Hearst, the man who raped her as a child. The trouble I started was nothing compared to hers. And there was no way, there was no way that I was going to let her face the consequences on her own. Because that's me, Michael Digger Dixon. It is the way I am wired. I'd spent all Sunday in the north of the island with my friend, Karen, who headed, who headed a semi-military unit of four. We called them the Bush Rangers. They had the gun skills and bushcraft of soldiers, the arresting powers of police, and the deductive skills of detectives. Detective Superintendent Chilman, our old boss, had handpicked Karan and his crew to patrol the gloomy interior of the island. As usual, I'd spent the first hour with Karan talking about Detective Superintendent Chilman, our boss. He was a full-time drunk with a brain that had no room for bullshit and a tongue that stung like a syringe. The old fella had spent 30 years in the police force and he despised his colleagues because they were so useless at tackling crime. He decided that if he couldn't change the police force, he would create his own team by any and all means necessary. That meant breaking every recruitment rule. He picked me up off the streets in San Andrews. I was 19. I had just left school with no job, despite my qualification, and no prospect of one. A street killing changed my luck. My crime was simply being there. Chilman spotted me on the sidewalk, busy doing nothing. He arrested me and brought me to his office. Join the new CID, unit that he was forming, or face time in jail, he said. And I knew that he was not joking. He picked up Chief Officer Malan on Grand Beach with a shopping bag of marijuana, peddling the stuff to tourists. 14 years in prison and an unlimited fine or full employment with perks and prospects was Chilman's offer to Malan Graves. And there was Spider Face. Arrested with a bale of ganja in his boat, Spiderface gave the Coast Guard so much help before they caught him that Chillman was impressed enough to reward him with gainful employment. He must have said something different to Miss Tanis Laws' daughter. Best brains on the island, he told us when he dumped the woman on the department. Fucking blackmail! I'd shot at the old fellow once in a 
fit of irritation. Talent spotting, he retorted. Look at your record, Dixon. 1,000 police officers serving the island. 16 stations throughout the parishes, and San Andrew said he got the best crime-busting record in Kamaho, two years running. No wonder the whole damn police force want to mash us up, including the Minister of Justice. It was dusk by the time I came off the murderous mountain road after leaving Karan, heading towards River Road, which would take me into San Andrew's town. A line of vehicles stretched ahead of me as far as the old iron bridge that hung over the sea, blaring horns and shouting a few yards ahead. I pulled up on the side of the road, left my car, and followed the noise. A man was pinned up against a Nissan minibus by a mob. The windscreen was a spider web of punched in glass. The vehicle was skewed across the road with his engine running. About three yards ahead, a group of chattering teenagers were comparing phone footage of what looked like the mangled remains of a body. A slim boned, detached arm with five copper bracelets told me it was a woman. About 25, I guess. The rest of the woman, I was told, was scattered along the stretch of road. I walked into the crowd, raised my ID, and ordered them to disperse. They shuffled back a couple of feet with agitated voices. I knew the fella. He was a constable from San Andrews Police Central, locked down to a desk job because of the prosthetic, the prosthetic leg that he was wearing. There was a story floating in the force about his wife and a lover she flaunted in his face. Someone had already called the ambulance. No one phoned the police. I called Recovery, a three-man unit that Detective Superintendent Chilman had created for situations such as these. Fellows who would think nothing of eating their dinner with their plates sitting on a cadaver they used to be grave diggers. DC Dixon here, I said. This is one scrape of job, four hours worth of work. I gave them the coordinates and turned to the officer. He was stinking of alcohol. So, I said, what happened? People, people must have read my lips. He knocked the woman, he knocked down the woman. Driving drunk, he murdered she. The, 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 the woman got two little children and the father dragged she all the way from. I raised a cautioning hand at the speaker. A young fella with his hair pulled out in tufts like a fluffy porcupine. His voice was hot and raking. You, Dixon, from San Andrew, she ID, no, sir. I, I didn't see a man. I didn't see she. I could I swear was was a dog I hit, man. I thought he was a dog. So, you run over a dog and you keep driving? No, fella, don't follow me, man. Don't address me. You address me by my rank and name. You're stinking drunk and you're driving. You should be the, you should be the first to know it's a criminal offense. I turned to face the crowd. Who witnessed this? Four youths stepped forward with lit up smartphones. I took the handsets and stuffed them in my pocket. Collect them tomorrow from, from San Andrew's CID. I ignore their protests. Anybody else saw the accident? A man raised his hand, short, big eyes. I took his details. I turned back to the officer. If you don't know it yet, I arrest in your ass. I want jail for you. I want the maximum for you. Oh gosh, Dixon, I is an officer too. That make it worse. I handcuff him and drag him into my car. By the time I got to San Andrew Central Station, I was close to throwing up. 
Michael stank of the officer. He clearly had pissed himself and was a mumbling wreck on the back seat. I dragged him out and carried him inside. I demanded the keys from the duty officer, a bug-eyed young fella with a loose mouth, who dropped his gaze on the crumpled man then fixed my face. He looked confused, moved his lips as if he was about to say something but then changed his mind. He followed me to the cell. I opened it, dumped Busso inside, then locked him in. I'm DC Dixon. People call me Digger, I said to him. San Andrews CID. Mr. Digger, you sure? I more than sure. This officer just killed a woman. He said that he mistook her for a dog. Look at him. Drunk now ass and driving. I pocketed the keys. The young man pointed at my pocket. I ignored him, pulled out my notebook, and spent a few minutes writing. I tore out the page, and I held it out to him. What's your name? Ken, sir. You knew here, right? He nodded and took the page. Make sure the superintendent get this, I said. The, um, the, the, the key is Mr. Digger. He was chewing his lower lip and throwing glances in the direction of the cells. A low hum came from down the corridor. I gargled him from Busso, rock of ages. I keep in the keys, man. I strode out of the building. I'll stop here. Thank you.